Your father taught me how to drive on this very road, and I had to learn on a stick ship, Gertrude proudly, proudly uh, proclaimed, looking straight ahead while riding shotgun in Ian's car. Ian had heard that proclamation countless times, every other Sunday, in fact, for years, when he and Gertrude traveled that road to visit Ian's son and granddaughter, her grandson and great-granddaughter. Each time Ian would roll his eyes, then with as much enthusiasm as he could muster, he would say, really, tell me about it. Ian always talked to the windshield. He rarely used the title mom when talking to his mother. Ian didn't like her, let alone love her. The feeling was mutual, but he still felt some obligation to cart her along whenever he would visit his son and granddaughter. Now in her 90s and a widow for 30 years, Gertrude wasn't sure how many more visits were left, and neither was Ian. He never pondered that thought very long, being afraid of which direction his thoughts might take him. She would drone on, sometimes for 15 minutes, sometimes longer. But the story was always the same. The only difference was the length of her pauses as she searched for the right words, or perhaps thought about the relationship she had with her husband. He was always so patient, Gertrude would say in a halting, slightly haughty voice, especially when I was learning how to start from a dead stop going up a hill, or how to slow the car going downhill by shifting into a lower gear instead of using the brake. The only time the only time she would look over at Ian is when she got to this line. Your father would always touch my hand and say, you're doing great, Gertrude. Ian never took his eyes off the road. She would continue with a smile and a distinct pride in her voice. I was the very first person who took the driving test on the state police force, and I passed it on the very first try. I owed that success to your father, his knowledge, his patience, his gentle but commanding touch. There was even an article in the paper, Ian. I know, I seen and read the clipping, Ian said slightly above a mumble. It was becoming more difficult to hide his bored expression as he thought, exasperated. How many more times do I need to hear this story? Our responses are always the same. It's like Groundhog Day. He continued to address Gertrude. Yeah, I know, it's the one you had laminated and sits next to Dad's laminated obit in the hutch. Ian asked himself, but where are the articles of me serving in Vietnam? Or how I was wounded and spent four hellish months in a military hospital in Hawaii learning how to walk again. As far as Ian was concerned, there was only one article of value. I would like that obit, if you don't mind, he said in a clip tone. Gertrude would always respond in a taunting manner, her nose slightly tilted upward. Perhaps someday, Ian. Then she would say no more, yet she was still telling the story quietly in her head. Perhaps she didn't want, to, want Ian to know that, that much about her relationship with his father, or then again, perhaps there was nothing more to tell. But Ian thought he knew better from the look from what he had witnessed as a child and then through adulthood before his father's death. The looks his father got from other women when he entered a room and his quick glances of acknowledgement are the longer than expected hugs and kisses women gave him without any resistance on his part, or the lack of a response from his father when Gertrude would say she loved him as left the house for work, or that when he was offered the day shift at the post office, he chose to stay on graveyard, that maybe she wasn't the love of his father's life. Gertrude felt differently. She always professed that his father was the first and only love of her life. Gertrude never dated another man after her husband's death or removed her wedding ring. A confession Gertrude made to Ian on one occasion several years after his father's death led Ian to believe that perhaps she knew more than what he thought when she stated matter-of-factly, I believe that had I died first, your father probably would have remarried within a year or at very least would have taken up with another woman or woman and that's assuming he didn't leave me first. Ian wanted to retaliate to that revelation by saying, I believe you're right, with an ear to ear grin. But he held back because he had no interest in continuing the conversation as it now became apparent to his great satisfaction that Gertrude witnessed the same events. Instead, his only thought was, 
let sleeping dogs lie. Ian had his version of the truth about his father's true feelings towards Gertrude, and Gertrude had hers. Much to his dismay, Ian couldn't confirm either, as that secret was locked in his father's grave and now inside Gertrude's head. Two weeks passed. The next time Ian stopped at Gertrude's house was to pick her up for their Sunday journey. She was staring at some pictures of herself and her husband, which hung on the living room wall. There were a few portraits, one of the two of them after their wedding, with Ian's father dressed in his army uniform, and another taken on their 40th wedding anniversary, which is about a year before he passed away. There were also various pictures of them dancing together at celebratory events. She turned to Ian and with her wrinkled left hand pointed and said commandingly, please remove these pictures, Ian. They're just collecting dust. At first, Ian was shocked, hurt, and angry, but he hid it. He wasn't one to wear his heart on a sleeve. All he thought was, how could she do this to my father, he asked himself, and closed his eyes, shaking his head in disbelief. Whatever his faults were as a husband, he more than made up as a father. He always stood between me and her when I got in trouble as a kid, and he was the only one who visited or wrote or called me when I was recuperating in Hawaii. Not one lousy word from her, not one. She never gave a crap about me and still does it. It's always been about her and her stupid driving lesson. The shock quickly vanished, but not the hurt and anger. He was sobbing inside, still mourning his father as his thoughts rambled on. I'm glad she's taken down these pictures. He was too good for her. I'm surprised he stayed with her as long as he did. She should have, he, she should have died first. At least then he would have had a, a shot at being happy. I don't ever want to see the two of them together again, ever. Ian stood bold upright and was resolute in his response to a request. My pleasure. As he took down the pictures, he still found himself fixated on the image of Gertrude's left hand when she pointed. Something was different, but why? Reality struck and Ian's eyes grew wide. He asked flatly, where's your writing room? Gertrude reached in, into her right coat pocket and produced the ring, then went to the hutch and retrieved the laminated obit, a three by one inch article. Ian stood motionless, a silent spectator, not knowing what to expect. Gertrude walked back to Ian, opened his right hand, and placed both objects on it. She looked squarely into Ian's clear hazel eyes and spoke softly, but with a slightly aggrieved tone. The obituary is for you, Ian. Give the ring to your granddaughter when the time is right. Perhaps she will have better luck than I do. Gertrude paused, and Ian, Please take a different road this time. The end. So if anybody's had any uh, fond memories of their parents, uh, I guess that one would, would tend to do it. Uh, the uh, next short story I just want to, this one is actually even shorter. Uh, some of the stories I've written or longer, but uh, these two are, are pretty short. The next one is called The Box. Uh, this one, actually, I think was the first one I ever had published. And it really had to do very much with uh, corporate America. When I worked, uh, when I was, when I was uh, working in uh, corporate America, which I did for many years in sales, uh, anybody who's been around a company or the military for that fact uh, will understand, but Corporate America is kind of unique. So this next one's called The Box. A little uh, more tongue in cheek and a little bit uh, lighter, but still I hope you find it amusing. Uh, let's, uh, so again, just relax. Let me get to the box. A box is selfless, said John, my coworker and friend. It was his concluding declaration to our conversation before we started to repack our trophies into the boxes from which they came. John and I were invited to the annual awards banquet as we were among the top sales associates in the company. Although both of us had joined the company at about the same time, this was the first awards ceremony for me and the second for John. 
He received Rookie of the Year honors the previous, the previous year. John wasn't able to attend that ceremony, and neither of us really wanted to be at this one. Neither of us is comfortable with that much attention. But when the VP of the department says, request your presence, it's job security suicide not to attend. So there we were. Just look at this box. It's a work of art, is how he started the conversation. He gazed at the box in wonderment as a child would after opening a birthday or Christmas gift. I mean, it's so symmetrical. Anyone familiar with us knew exactly what he meant. There was nothing on our desk or standing partition wall that would give anyone insight into our personal lives. On our desk were a computer and a phone. The only items displayed on our walls were company policies or job-related information. And they were framed and hung in perfect balance and symmetry. One would have thought we had measured the distance up from the desk to between each frame with a laser. We didn't. We just used a ruler, although the thought of using a laser did cross our mind. The box is sturdy and the lid fits so tightly, Alan, that when you replace it, the air rushes out onto your fingertips. Feel it? As he demonstrated several times, I tried it with my box and found he was correct. Even the fabric covering the box is perfectly fitted both inside and out. What craftsmanship? Whoever made the box obviously knew what they were doing, more so than the person who designed this loose light piece of crap. He said, holding up the trophy. To me, a box is sometimes more important than the thing inside of it. He waxed on philosophically for several more minutes, extolling the virtues of a box. It holds, preserves, and protects memories, those things we cherish or perhaps want to pass down to future generations. He then added in a hushed voice, it can hold secrets. It's also used to bury people, I said in a somber tone remembering family and friends I have loved and lost. But I suppose that goes along with most of what you're saying. John made no comment, just nodded his head in agreement. After a few moments, John broke the silence. So Alan, what are you gonna put in your box? Well, my military medals and the flag I received from my father's funeral. How about you? Not sure yet, but I know it won't hold this stupid trophy. The box is too good for that. In fact, I believe it would be an insult to the box. And laughed, doing his best to lighten the mood. One of the other recipients who knew us well caught the tail end of the conversation and joined in, uninvited, of course. So, are you guys going to put the awards on your desk, he said with a devilish smile. No, John and I said in unison with a dismissive tone and look. Symmetry. It would break the symmetry, I said as there would be nothing on the other side of the desk to balance it out. Besides, said John, it'd just be one more thing we would have to dust, which is why I'm not even going to display it at home. I made no comment, just shrugged my shoulders. So don't you want others to see what you have accomplished, asked the uninvited guest. Not necessary, I responded crisply. You know what we've accomplished. The rest of the company knows what we accomplished. More importantly, John and I know what we've accomplished. As far as I'm concerned, we're the only ones who count. Although I wasn't entirely sure I believed all of what I was saying. John smiles at all what he was thinking. Whatever, said the other recipient, shaking his head. I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to take advantage of the open bar. And then he offered up one last dig. It's just a stupid box. You guys know that, right? He turned and walked away without waiting for an answer. Sure. John commented, stating the obvious. He just doesn't get it. That's when John offered himself this comment. We both smiled and finished the repacking. Although neither of us are big drinkers, we agreed to partake of the company's generosity at the open bar. On the way over, though, I started to seriously question my decision about not displaying the trophy on my desk. After all, I did earn it. If I displayed it, John might think I betrayed it. If I did it, the company might think I didn't appreciate their reward. I felt slightly embarrassed that, at my age, I might be caving the peer pressure. Was I? A few days after the ceremony, I came to the decision. It was one that I was not entirely pleased with, and pretty sure no one would be either. 
I would display the trophy on one side of the box, bounce it out with the box on the other side, and dust both with the Swiffer that I kept in my desk drawer. There, problem solved. No one's happy. Hopefully next year they'll just give us a stupid gift card.